Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Well, I'm Tony, Anthony Roth, actually. Uh, I work for the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology and Data Preservation. Uh, a few years ago, we were uh, we received a grant to start scanning new beef mining's uh, collection of stoke books, uh, which consisted of about 46 books. And I've just kind of continued on scanning uh, some of Montana Resources books and, of course, uh, Butte's Overbow Public Archives books also. Uh, so with that, or with that said, I'll continue with my presentation. Today's presentation is called Butte's Dope Books, What We Know About What Lies Below. We're talking about what lies below the surface of Butte, Montana. So the first question is, what is a stoke book? And a stoke book is a book or a set of books that contains detailed survey information about the underground workings of a mine. Specifically, the Butte Stoke Books cover the Butte District or Butte Mining District on the Butte Hill. <coughs> the exact date of the books, uh, the beginning date of books are unknown, but are believed to have been started around 1923. And this comes to, uh, comes in from a gentleman by the name of Mel Rowling. I had a sit down interview with him, and he was one of the guys that actually drew in these books. Uh, he actually finished off drawing the books in about 1976, 77. He closed the books. And the books were officially closed again with, uh, by the Mount, uh, Anaconda Mining Company in 1977. However, the books were continued, were continued to be edited uh, through 1988 with exploration of Newview Mining and some other exploration work. The Stowe books cover approximately 5.87 square miles of surface, or of, of uh, surface space on the Butte Hill, and they can see <coughs> the workings of every mine within the index guide. You can actually see how big these books are. That's that's one of the stove books right there. They're not a small book. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. So again, the books are fairly good size. Uh, about this big, uh, and they, again, they contain the workings for almost every major mine in view. Uh, up here, we see the Badger, and of course, the Kelly, the Granite Mountain, and the Pilot View, which sits down the workings off the Granite Mountain Speculator on uh, Arco property up there uh, in Pitt. <laughs> so, what we're looking at here is the actual index guide for the Butte Stove Books. Everything that's in color. Is, uh, is the area the stove books cover. And this specific map here, you can see all the, oops, excuse me, all the yellow books are held by New Butte Mining up at the Missoula Mine. All the green books are held here at the archives in the back in the Anaconda lockers, and all the red books are held by Montana Resources. There are 352 total books. New Butte Mining again holds 46 of these books. Butte Silver Bowl Public Archives holds 144 of them. And Montana Resources holds 156 of the collection. Uh, we, there are six books that are unaccounted for, uh, a few around the Leonard, deep down on the Leonard Mine. So if anybody knows where these books might be, we would greatly appreciate getting them back. <coughs> uh, throughout his history, uh, just by studying these books, we know there were two versions of these stoke books. One was a master copy, which re was retained on the fifth floor of the Hennessy Building under the supervision of Reno Sales. And these books were updated daily as the, as the surveyors went down into the underground mines. They came back and they made notes in the book, uh, or updated books with the notes they made from their underground uh, walks. Marino Sales was the father of mining geology. He was chief geologist for Anaconda Mining Company for over 40 years, and he was very uh, well known for develop, developing the systematic and very detailed mapping procedure to provide scientific testimony uh, when the amalgamated trust company was sued uh, with over 100 lawsuits uh, trying to discredit the company. So this is where the soap books started coming into play at. They started surveying so they could prove the ownership and the workings of the mines. So the master copy again held at the uh, Hennessy building. Oops, excuse me. Going the wrong way here. You're still going the wrong way. <laughs> Other button. I swear that. There we go. Yeah. So again, the mine copy, uh, excuse me, the mine copy was held at the, at the mine office. 
Uh, these were updated semi-annually semi or every six months, and we do not know where the current location of these copies were. Uh, we do know there was a second copy of the books due to this uh, small book. It's a small notebook over at Montana Resources that had notes in it. There's sp specifically noted that book M, oops, me, book M31, there was a copy made and delivered to the mine uh, on a certain date. This, this specific mm. book went to the Belmont. <laughs> the only time the master copy ever left, left the Hennessy building was in, in a case of a mine fire. And the reason that book actually went to the mine site was it was the latest and greatest workings of the mine at the time. So totals to date, uh, what has been done versus what's left to complete with the stoke books. We have 46 books scanned for New Butte Mine Mining's Holdings. Uh, that project was completed in July 2020. We have 61 stoke books scanned as of yesterday from the Butte Silver Bowl Public Archives, which is an ongoing collaboration of work. And there are 19 stoke books that are currently scanned uh, from Montana Resources for a total of 126 books scanned, 226 books left to scan. And if you're a IT person or you like data, 13.25 terabytes of information held on our servers at the moment, <coughs> backed up in duplicate. <coughs> so down and dirty on the stove books. Each page represents 8,800 square feet. Uh, each page also re represents on a vertical scale 6.64 in elevation of workings, unless otherwise noted. Uh, other notes would be around the Lexington. You'll see notes on the page on the pages around the Lexington that a specific stope is only 5.3 feet tall or 6.1 feet tall. Uh, there's notes all over the pages, and I've only seen that around the Lexington for some reason. Uh, the pages are done in a one inches or one one inch equals 50 foot scale, and even though as you as you flip through these books, if you were to go back into the back uh, of the archives and pull one of these books out and start flipping through the pages, you'll see a lot of blank pages in the books. The reason for those blank pages, even though there's no information on those pages, they do represent elevation. So you might have a working, say, for example, the top of the 200-13 level, there might not be anything above that and then breaks into the 100 level, so that 6.64 feet has to be represented even though there was no workings there. Each book footprint, if you were to spread the book out, it represents 40.4 acres of surface space, which is 2,200 feet wide by 800 feet tall. Each one of those squares up here represents 200 feet. Each volume set uh, starts at the very collar of the mine. The collar is the, the, the very beginning of the surface where the shaft actually starts, and the volume or set of books ends at the lowest part of the mine. And just for historical purposes, the Clark's Fraction Shaft, which is in Book U17, Volume 1, is actually the highest collar uh, in Butte in, that's noted in the stove books. I always thought it was the Margaret Ann up uh, above the uh, old school up here, but it, the market end is actually lower in elevation than Clark Fraction. Each volume set ends at the deepest part of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the deepest part of the mine. Uh, the Mount Con set of books, which center around the Con shaft, actually is nine volumes deep. Uh, and it goes down to, if you look in the book, 845 feet above sea level. I was always out there to discredit the information on the Mount Con. There's no way a mine can be a mile deep on the Butte Hill. It's actually a little bit over a mile deep, uh, a few feet. <laughs> so that, what you're looking at right here is the actual stove book page. You cut out of the stove book page showing the very bottom of the shaft uh, for the Mount Con. The, the 82 feet past one mile is where she actually sits. Standards of sketching come into play. Uh, we do have this uh, <coughs> map up in the Data Preservation Office. Standard, standards of sketching actually show the surveyors how to draw stopes and how to drop level or draw levels out. But Anaconda Company, they followed these maps, or excuse me, these standards pretty religiously. 
but I have seen symbols that are specific to Anaconda Company and they only show up in the books. I have not been able to find them on any kind of geology maps other than on the Butte Hill and in the Stoke books. Huh. So the shaft collars uh, usually started again at the, at the surface. There are collars that are underneath the surface where they've done some working, say, the 200-foot level and then drilled another shaft, and they are named. I've, I've seen some of that. But for the most part, the shaft starts at the collar on the surface. And you can see here we have the excuse me, McBaron shaft here. We have the Prospector uh, incline shaft. It's always noted whether the shaft is an incline or actually a vertical shaft. Uh, if, it's, if it's not marked, like this one, it is a straight down vertical shaft. Uh, you always have the sh shaft name. You most of the times have the shaft collar elevation of, or the elevation on the hill. And usually how many number of compartments the shaft is. They can go up to uh, three and a half compartments, I believe. Uh, excuse me, four compartments. I believe the Kelly shaft is a four compartment shaft. So is each of those square, never mind. <laughs> you okay. just answered it in your notes. Oh, okay. So each, each one of these is squares a short, is a compartment. Yeah, what we're looking at here is a compartment on a shaft. Uh, of course, you have a single compartment shaft. You have a, a compartment and a half, which would be the chippy shaft for hauling equipment or people up and down through the mine. And then you have, uh, as, as you add, of course, more uh, shafts, more compartments. Uh, I have seen up to three and a half. I haven't worked with the Kelly uh, mine area at all, so I can't tell whether it's a three and a half or a four compartment shaft yet. Uh, there were different variations of collars, uh, and they are noted in the stove books. You have lined, which you see right here, or uh, excuse me, just a standard collar, which is uh, what you what's depicted here. You have a line shaft, uh, and the line shaft will usually have a ring drawn around the collar up here. We'll have another ring around that uh, drawing. And then sometimes they're noted with what material was used, whether it was uh, brick, whether it was wood. However, uh, in the books I've scanned, I have not seen that noted yet. Elevations in the books are always noted in red, uh, and they uh, differentiate from the uh, ACM elevations, uh, US to USGS elevations. The, difference in elevations is 54.44 feet. Uh, I don't know why this was done. Of course, the USGS back was, well, probably was not around back in 1920, so all this was based off of Anaconda uh, ACM measurements. Uh, so if you, found, if you knew the elevation of a shaft, say, for example, the orphan girl right here, the elevation was 5236.68 feet above sea level. If you subtract 54.44 feet, you will get actual current elevation on Google Earth or uh, okay. USGS. And that is done in a WGS 83 day set. <clears throat> Drifts were horizontal passages uh, that went across from the main shaft. Uh, and they followed the bed of vein, or they followed the ore, basically. Uh, if you were to take one stove <coughs> and make the pages transparent, the, uh, all the drifts on the map and we'll stack them on top, of, uh, on top of each other, you'll actually see that vein as it worked through the book. It's just like uh, the old Mickey Mouse cartoons where you can flip through the pages. You can do that with the stove books and actually watch that vein move. <clears throat> the winds is a minor connection between different levels in a mine. When uh, worked upwards, uh, from a lower level, it was called a raise. When it was worked down from the level, it was called a sump. Uh, and if it went up or down, vertical or horizontal, that was usually a passageway or a manway. Sills and floors, floors, floors are also known as levels. Uh, the sill is the main floor you were standing on. So just put, to, to put this in an uh, easy to follow description, I'm say, say I'm standing right here on the 100 foot level of a mine. This is called the floor, the sill. Uh, that is where all the ore was trans, trans, transported out to the shaft to be hauled to the surface. Every level above that floor, which is 6.64 feet, turns into a floor. So you have the sills that you walk on and then you have the floors that you actually worked on. Uh, 
floors and sills can be the same elevation. So, for example, we can have the Pilot Butte 1600-19 level, which is 19 floors above the 1600 sill, is even with the Elmer Lou 1400 sill. Uh, all the levels in Butte, after they reached 2200 feet, they were all the same all the way across through the city. Above 2200 feet, they differentiated. Colors in the book, what we found. Uh, this is actually the only legend I've found in the book so far. Uh, the books uh, run up to 1916. You will notice all the different colors that they represent. These colors are hand painted with watercolors. And after 1923, or up to 1923, the colors were not repeated. After 1923, the colors were repeated every 10 years, excuse me, 1916. The years repeated every 10 years. So, for example, we have yellow right here was repeated 1920, 30, 40, 1950, up until 1970. Uh, we do have some workings in 1980, although they are not colored, they are just hand drawn. 1897 was the earliest colored workings I've seen in the books, uh, and that is depicted right here on the map. <coughs> All workings prior to 1897 are colored gray, and they are either uh, dotted through the books or they are uh, noted with the words PR or prior to. Uh, if they were noted prior, or excuse me, uh, noted with a different date, it's usually noted in the books prior to 1898, prior to 1897. But for the most part, we see no workings prior to 1897 that are dated. Workings that are drawn out with dashes represent workings that were transcribed in from other geologic maps. So we have uh, areas around the Speculator, the Granite Mountain, the Elmer Lou area, all these companies that own these mines made their own maps. And when Anaconda Company came in and started building the books, they were get, taking these maps and they started transcribing them into the stove books. So here we see the dotted lines. They had not actually gone out and surveyed these workings yet. Uh, so this is how they are depicted in the stove books. Timber sets as represented on a sill are shown like little square boxes. That's where the actual timber sets were to hold the earth up above the sills uh, and in the stove. So what you see right here is actually what a uh, timbering would actually look like in a mine. Timber is also noted in the books as t t actually written out as timber or TBR or TMBR. Uh, there are a lot of areas, uh, and I'll just use this map for an example. You'll have a blank area right here. It'll actually just say timbered in there without the little boxes drawn in. <clears throat> Survey points are noted uh, in all the all the stove books by these little circles. And the survey points were put into place in the books every time they were done by line of sight. So every time the mine changed, the direction of the tunnel changed, or the drift changed, they did a survey point. They also did survey points at the beginning of each timber set to tell where the timber set actually started, where the timber set ended. Any major change, they usually ran a survey point. It is said that Anaconda Company was uh, within one-tenth of an inch on their survey point. So they were very meticulous about their survey. And the reason for this, they're paid, they're, they're, they were earning money to mine ore, not waste dry. So they had to be spot on. Shoots and ladders. I like to joke, not the game that we remember growing up, but <laughs> <laughs> they are depicted in the stove books. Uh, they're drawn on the sills, uh, as you can see. A ladder is drawn uh, that represents a manway. And then, of course, it looks like a little slide here that re represents a chute. Anytime you get below or above the sill, they're represented with a C or an M. M for manway, C for chute. Bulkheads and plugs. Uh, bulkheads were used to seal off certain workings of the mine. Say they were done working that area of the mine. They <coughs> sealed it off. They usually let it fill with, fill with water and then pump the water out over the concentrator. And, take the heavy metals out, the copper and things like that. It was kind of a natural process. Uh, it was also used to stop fire progression. For example, the Modoc mine fire in 1917. 
that's probably one of the reasons all the people uh, passed away in the speculator and granite mountain fire was when they were working down below they could still smell smoke because it was not sealed off and they everybody that was working down below kept thinking oh that's just the modoc that's we're just smelling smoke from the modoc when in fact it was actually the granite mountain and the speculator mine fire starting up uh, drill stopes and raise numbering this is where it kind of gets uh, a little confusing on how the how these numbers are written and it took me a little while to figure out and that Mel, Mel Rowling actually helped me figure these out uh, Larry Hoffman has helped me out with some of this numbering too, but there are some things we still don't understand about the books. So, in, they're, they're noted in series and levels. Uh, numbers, you have different uh, drift, stoke, and raise numbers. For example, up here on the right side, you have this 2849. That's depicting that it's the 2800 level of the mine, and that's the 49th drift in that series. This is the very first series uh, in a certain set of series in the mine. There is no letter in front of the in front of the number, hence that is the first series. If it had an A, that would be a second series, a B would be the third series, and so forth, however many directions they went. Once you get up here, you can see where, where we pick up the A here, that would be the second series on the 2800 level, and this would be the, excuse me, the 12th drift on the 2800 in series number one. We get down into the raises. We look at this number here. B would be the third series. This one actually is coming from the 3000 level. So we're going from the 3000 level to the 2800 level. We're going up approximately 200 feet up. Uh, this connection right here, it's the 37th raise. R stands for raise. So that's the 37th raise in the second series from the 3000 level. 2800 or one uh, one level or a few levels below uh, so that just depicts that it's coming up from the 3000 level rather than the 2800 we're actually standing on the 2800 sill abbreviations we have several abbreviations in the stone book uh, right here I can just got to renege on what I said earlier Kelly the Kelly shaft is a four compartment shaft <laughs> it's right there on my presentation DH stands for drill hole, DDH, deep drill hole, or diamond drill hole. Uh, we have DNI, and I see that a lot around the speculator, uh, granite mountain mines, which meant do not ink, which uh, also meant they were planning to go down and resurvey. Once it was surveyed and the notes were made, then they would go through and hard ink uh, the information into these stove books. Uh, you have several others like LH, TR for top of rail, TS, top of shaft. Uh, and we get down uh, PI, I've only seen PI in the book one time, and that is at the very beginning of the Alice Lexington Tunnel, right there in the Syndicate Pit. There, that's your initial point of entry, that is your initial point of survey, so IP would be initial point. And then we have a few notes in the books that say inaccurate also. So. I don't know how inaccurate they were. Uh, I wasn't a surveyor back then. There's only one thing I have not figured out in the books. I ran into a uh, little some lettering called IDE. I have no clue what it means. So if anybody or anyone in the room is an old miner or worked uh, the, the hill uh, back in the day, maybe drew out these books, you could enlighten me, please. <laughs> so why is this information important to you? The mining stopped in 1982. As everybody knows, the pumps were shut off on the pit. So the pit began to fill with water. This uh, diagram here, Ted Duane, Paul Thale, and uh, Patrick Canelli drew this diagram out uh, for the Bureau of Mines way back when. This shows all the major haulage ways for ore to come out of the hill uh, dating back into 2004. The reason we can use these stove books is that it'll give us, it'll uh, enlighten us as to the levels between the major haulage ways. So how much of that is all open between those haulage ways? So as the pit filled up with water, all these haulage ways filled up with water also, and then all the stoves filled up with water, we cannot go back down 
uh, and look at all this stuff or survey any of this information because it's all underwater now. So the stoke books are the best thing we have to look at the Butte Hill. Uh, it, there are 10,000 plus miles of underground workings on the Butte Hill and 47 miles of GIS verified vertical workings on the Butte Hill. Uh, here's another depiction, uh, the same map, uh, just a different part of the map. Again, this shows all the major haulage ways on the Butte Hill. Uh, this map shows the workings between the 1880s and 1982. And it was based, the map, the map was built on the best technology at the time. So in 2004, this is how they built it with their technology. Again, these tow books will help fill in the voids between those areas, the areas where the, uh, the ore was taken out. So it'll help understand how hollow the, the hill actually is. The current water level of the pit. You can see uh, this was uh, verified uh, the other day with uh, Ted Duane. The water level at the Emma mine down here in Emma Park is 214 feet below the collar or the surface of the mine. And at the Mount Con up the hill, it's two, or excuse me, 733 feet below the sill, or speed feet below the collar. If you put that on an easy to read graph, where you're sitting at right here, this window sill right here, 354 feet below your butt is water. Okay. You can actually stick the Statue of Liberty in that area. So, Butte also have, Butte has a history of subsidences on the hill. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a 30-foot sinkhole up on West Broadway. Uh, opened up, they said it was like 70 feet deep. The top of the stove was about 70 feet down. So it, it went a lot further than 70 feet. They ended up capping it, uh, reclamating the area. But it was starting to, and you can see, uh, excuse me, on this picture, it was starting to peel the bedroom off the house. So the lady just removed the bedroom and a couple <laughs> a couple days after they moved the bobcat, the bobcat, I guess, was just, this is hearsay. The bobcat was sitting right above that stove. They had pulled the bobcat out off the stove and the next morning, the stove opened up. So that has since been fixed. That was back oh, 2018. Will the issues ever stop on the Butte Hill? You can see here, looking down, they have a four foot sinkhole in the backyard. More backyard Butte. Spring equals sinkholes because the water tends to impermeate the ground. The ground gets soft and starts uh, dropping in on these workings. <clears throat> and this one was up in Walkerville. So it's not just Encompassing around Butte, of course, Walkerville is part of Butte. A lot of a lot of the Alice workings are up around uh, the, the Molten, the Alice, the Bell of Butte. They all have workings that go under the hill. So these these may, in, in a certain time uh, time frame, they might may decide to collapse or something like that. Uh, I can't say whether the mines were backfilled with gob or slime or anything like that. I don't know if the stove books are very meticulous about telling you when the workings of the mine were backfilled. They were, uh, they were marked with hashtags. The only time I've seen these uh, backfilled with gob or slime is way down deep in the mines. Uh, they take their waste rock, dump them down the shafts because they wouldn't haul their waste rock to the surface. So they backfill the workings. It's, it's all way down deep. Subsidence issues in view will probably never stop. Okay. This picture was taken by Ted Duane back in 1995. It's kind of an interesting story he told me about. This is the Belmont shaft, right over here at the Belmont Senior Citizen Center, uh, right underneath the head frame. They were actually going to drill, uh, run a drill rig down uh, this spot. They had a blockage in the shaft. I don't know what they were doing. I wasn't around at that time, but Ted had told me that they were out inspecting the site the day before this happened. They pulled up to the fence the next morning and the shaft had collapsed in that 24 hour period. Uh, they were just getting ready to pull the dr drill rig out onto this and drill down and unblock whatever was blocking the shaft. So 
Food for thought, still books will also help us identify areas of subsidence in view. Uh, Butte and <clears throat> came to me five or six years ago. They had a Google Earth footprint showing about 400 shafts that they have physically located in the city of Butte using the Stowe books and other surveys. I've been able to find over 1,400 shafts in Butte so far. Okay. They go all the way out here to Rocker, the Ramsey area, clear out here uh, off the East Ridge, and then work way up by Molten Reservoir. Uh, predominantly, they're sticking around uptown Butte here, uh, kind of like Swiss cheese. What we're looking at here is the Badger State Mine. When I, when I work these KML files uh, with these stove book pages, I take the backgrounds out of the books. I transpose these uh, images onto Google Earth so you can actually see the workings in real time on Google Earth. I also highlight the black, uh, the black lines on the map and I turn them yellow so you can actually see the workings. Uh, and I'm working in a collaboration with Butte Silver Bow, uh, the subsidence division, so we can actually understand areas to kind of watch where we might have some issues. Again, this is the Badger State. What you're going to see are the workings within 200 feet of surface here. So we have all kinds of tunnels here coming off the main shaft. We also have workings up here. Uh, the moose actually sits up here. Here's the pilot view. Uh, I do have some of that also done, but we are just specifically looking at the badger here. This is the Missoula. So this area here, that's the Missoula mine yard. The Lexington would be sitting right up here off the side of the screen. You're, again, you're seeing, seeing uh, areas of interest within 200 feet or areas that have been mined out within, within 200 feet of surface. So all these areas right here, excuse me, back one, all these areas here uh, could possibly subside if we were to get a heavy rainstorm or maybe an earthquake or something like that. I'm not saying they will or won't, but it's just areas to be uh, aware of. We have Mount Consolidated, or the old Mount Con, or the Con, as a lot of you guys know it. <coughs> These are areas of interest for subsidence around the Mount Con area. Uh, and you, the, more, the more dense the yellow is, the more vertical the vein goes. So it goes, the, the, the brighter the yellow, the more straight down the workings are. Uh, the interesting note here is this walking trail right here across here. Uh, this area right here on the walking trail is about 46 feet is where the stove is underneath the ground where you're, when you're walking across. Same way with over here, it's about 50 feet, 52 feet below your feet when you're walking across that trail. You get over to this area here, it's, those workings actually start about 130 feet below the surface. The last one, the chalk and awe, I guess. <laughs> this would be the area, West Junior High have the hospital up here, you have the Emma mine right here, the Travona sits right here. Those are all the workings within 300 feet of surface. So we have this giant stove coming right down here. This is actually the 300 foot of the, the Travona, and I wasn't going to include this uh, in the, in the uh, subsidence areas, but I felt Buttes Over Bow would, uh, it would be a good idea to show Buttes Over Bow that the Travona actually connected with the Emma right here in this area. Uh, it actually dipped up about six, or excuse me, not dipped, but uh, there was a ladder that went up about six, six to ten feet and hooked into the uh, orphan girl working, or excuse me, the Emma workings. Uh, so just that was just kind of showing how, that the mines were connected between the two mines. The Travona also connected, I don't have the book done, but the Travona connected down through here to the Ofer, down over here. And then, of course, we have the Star West down here. Uh, this tunnel right here actually sits about 158 feet below the uh, running track at West Junior or West Elementary. I, I actually thought that this tunnel emptied out the surface right here because if you look at the workings right here, you can see a waste waste piles sitting there still to this day. The waste piles are there. Whether it opened the surface and they were just dumping their waste or out or not, I do not know. That is just speculation on my part. 
And I'd like to thank Beats of Goal Art guys for letting me scan their beautiful books, Montana Standard for their subsidence pictures, and Jeanette Kopp at the World Museum of Mining for letting me borrow some of the uh, pictures for the uh, mine fires like Modoc and the Speculator. Any questions? Very good, though.